our constituents learn that any one of these uh, folks are earning uh, these kinds of uh, salaries in the wake of, of our constituents earning just what they're earning, they're just not going to be satisfied with uh, the way this is going. So uh, I might ask you to comment on, on that, that uh, issue. Thank you, Congressman. This is um, an area we've done a lot of work on, beginning with Im imposing the executive compensation requirements that were specified in the ESA. We impose those day one from the program. Uh, the Obama administration has now, in early February, the Treasury Department came out with new, uh, tighter executive compensation policies. And then in the stimulus bill, there is an amendment that also has executive compensation policies. So we've taken this issue very seriously. There's a team right now at Treasury working on the stimulus, the new law, putting that together with the administration's new policy to come out with a robust set of new regulations that are going to govern the banks that are taking the TARP funds and covering many of their top executives on how much they can earn and what form that compensation is. So we heard it. We got the message. We're working hard on it. I understand it's a lot of mid-level management, too. We're not just talking the top, top. The uh, gentleman's time has thank expired. You. I thank the gentleman. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Turner of Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Kashkari. Appreciate you being here. Um, I, I'll, I'll tell you up front, I voted against this program. <clears throat> I voted against this program because basically four reasons. One, I didn't believe there was a very good definition or focus on what the program was to do. You know, we were first told it was toxic assets. Now it has not been. Uh, two, I think there was a lack of understanding of the process. What happens after the monies are made available, that process. <clears throat> Third, I didn't think it addressed the practices that got us here to begin with. It didn't stop the practices that, that were occurring. And four, it was unclear as to where the money was needed and how much was needed. Now, you have been very forthcoming. I want to congratulate you on you're doing a very good job in, in answering our questions. But no one can still answer those four questions. I mean, we're now several billion dollars, hundred billion dollars into this, and, and we're still where we don't have a clear focus of what we're going to be doing with these funds. We're not certain as to what the process is going to be. We have not addressed at all any of the practices that got us in this place. And still, you are unable to tell us how much money this is going to take. Now, I wanted to comment on one thing that you had said. Uh, you had said, when someone asked you, how did we get in this, this situation? You said <clears throat> that banks loaned borrowers money that they couldn't pay. Homeowners have responsibility and regulators have responsibility. Well, I want to tell you that I come from Ohio. Montgomery County, Ohio is, is the place where I live. It's in the center of my district. Um, and we have the foreclosure crisis. And we've had it for over a decade. Um, the, um, it's been about 27,000 foreclosures have occurred in my county since the six and a half years that I have, have been here in Congress of a county that has a population of around 500,000. Unbelievable numbers of foreclosure. I believe that it's not just that banks loaned money to people who couldn't pay. I believe from the experience that we've seen in our county of people who have tried to address this issue that it's actual structural issue. It's a leverage ratio. That that predatory lenders and subprime lenders were actually targeting homeowners and loaning them money that was in excess of the value of the home, which of course results structurally in a situation where when there's financial stress that you have to go to foreclosure. If you have no equity, you have no option other than to go to foreclosure. And the big banks initially would say, well, we're not really part of that. But, but they were, because what was happening is, I believe, the structural aspect of loaning greater than the value of the, of the property People didn't care because they were selling these things as securities on down the stream. So they didn't care if it was a workable loan or if the asset was overvalued because in the end they weren't going to get stuck in the musical chairs of, of these, these assets. Um, I think in the end when we get these evaluated we're going to find that this is somewhat the largest theft in history that has occurred of people who overvalued assets, sold them down the stream, and then the American taxpayers are stepping in unfortunately, um, with, uh, with, with their own dollars to try to make up the gap. Now, here's my concern specifically about an, an issue that uh, was alluded to in the beginning of this discussion. Some of the monies that are being provided are, are going to appear to assist in transactions where the money is leaving the country. Now, I think, you know, everybody up here understands that there are you know, international practices of, of the, the um, flows of capital and that needs to happen for our economy to be, be successful also. Um, but the Fed Chairman yesterday, Bernanke, stated this, asking about the crisis itself. He says, in my view, 
However, it is impossible to understand this crisis without reference to the global imbalance in trade and capital flows that began in the latter half of the 1990s. Well, back to my concern about the practices haven't changed. One of my concerns is that the manner in which this is occurring does not have any protections or requirements that the dollars address the issues of, of our economy and that portions of, large portions of these dollars are, are leaving our economy. That would put us on the wrong side of the ledger and in the same types of practices that Branke just said are, are underlining this. We, we know that you can't, in, in providing dollars, stop international flows of capital. We don't want that. But I am concerned that what you're doing might facilitate or incent additional dollars leaving uh, our economy that are specifically intended to prop up our economy. Could you please comment? Sure, Congressman. Thank you. Um, I didn't catch all of Chairman Bernanke's remarks, but I believe he's referring to uh, there's many economists think that there's been a glut of savings around the world in developing countries, and it's been coming into our capital markets. So the, ca the cash has actually been flowing the opposite. It's been flowing to America, which has given us very low borrowing rates and encouraged us, some would say, to take on more debt, maybe more debt than we can afford. And so I think we have to be careful, especially right now. We want all the capital we can get to get through this crisis, and we need to let the global economy restabilize to a new equilibrium where savings and all of these things are balanced. So I take your point. I hear it. And I, I agree with the spirit of it. I'm just offering a word of caution about saying, let's stop money flowing in this one direction because it will end up stopping it coming back the way that we want it. Uh, the gentleman's time has expired, but I do, I, I do want to say uh, we're going to uh, have two more members to ask questions and then we'll uh, take a brief recess. I also want to tell the, uh, the, the gentleman from Ohio uh, that uh, since you raised the question about Montgomery County and, and of course Dayton, and since my own community in Cleveland uh, was a subject of a New York Times uh, magazine article uh, this past week, uh, we are going to go back to Ohio, and we'll come to, uh, to your community as well. Uh, and maybe we can get the hearings on the same day in Cleveland and in Dayton. So I just want you to know that this, this committee is going to be going deeply into these affected areas. I, I thank the gentleman for raising the question, and the chair recognizes Mr. Welch. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Kashkari. Uh, just a few things uh, to establish where we agree. Uh, you'd agree, obviously, that the taxpayer is entitled to know uh, how taxpayer money is spent. Yes. Uh, and I assume you'd agree that shareholders would, would be entitled to know how shareholder money is spent. Yes. Uh, and, of course, the biggest recipient of taxpayer money to date, uh, or one of the biggest, is AIG. Uh, and that's where the taxpayer is fronting money, and the taxpayer, in fact, is an 80 percent owner, correct? Yes. Uh, and we're providing that money in order to avert uh, the, a conclusion that's been reached at Treasury and the Fed uh, that to let AIG go down would cause systemic failure, correct? Yes. Now, do you, Donald Cohn, who is the vice chair, as you know, of the Federal Reserve, uh, says that AIG has no obligation to name the counterparties. Uh, who have been paid uh, via taxpayer money that has been transferred to AIG, correct? I read uh, G Governor Cohn's or Vice Chair Cohn's testimony, but I don't remember that exact quote, but I defer to you, sir. Okay. Do you agree with him? I believe uh, institutions such as AIG that receive extraordinary assistance have a moral obligation to disclose as much as possible to the American people. Uh, if I may permit, if you'll permit me to give you a thorough answer. The challenge here is, as I indicated earlier, we want to prevent a financial collapse to stabilize the system, and we want to pay back the taxpayers. And so we have to be careful that just as any business, if you put, if you force businesses to expose all of their business decisions, all of who their customers are, all of who their counterparties are, that may actually put them at a competitive disadvantage. Right, so and then it makes it harder to pay back the taxpayers. Yeah, I get it. So then you agree with Governor Cohen. We'll leave it to AIG to decide what information they will disclose and they won't disclose with them making the final decision on whether that is a business interest or not, correct? No, I, I believe we can, we can work with the Fed to work with AIG and figure out, take a, take a look from Treasury's perspective right, let me, let me and ask say you what's this. appropriate to disclose. Some of that AIG money uh, that's to avert t uh, the systemic failure is to make certain that average Americans who have AIG insurance policy, AIG annuities, 
uh, and on AIG financial products uh, and pensions uh, don't get hammered, correct? Yes, correct. Uh, but some of the counterparties are uh, uh, eyes wide open investors. Uh, some of the largest investment banks that we used to have in this country, hedge funds, and speculators who made bets that turned out sour. Uh, do you believe that it would be of interest to the American taxpayer to know whether their money is being used to protect those annuity holders, those insurance policy holders, those pensioners on the one hand uh, versus the hedge fund speculators, uh, investment banks on the other? Just yes or no? Well, C Congressman, I'd like to provide you a thorough answer because it's important. No, the question is a simple one. Would, in your opinion, do you think it would be of interest to taxpayers to know whether it's the hedge funds, investment banks, speculators being assisted with their money or annuity holders, pensioners, uh, and insurance uh, contract holders? And the, the answer is they're all being benefited because there's, unfortunately, there's no way we can go in to stabilize an institution and say, just the policyholders are stabilized. If Why we not? Because if we did that, the, the other counterparties would put the firm into bankruptcy, and that would cause the whole firm to fail. That, that's the unfortunate choice we don't have. If we step in to support a systemic institution, all of their customers, all of their counterparties benefit, whether we like it or okay. not. So if the taxpayer, it's their taxpayer money, it's the shareholder money, and you believe they have a right to know how taxpayer and shareholder money is being used. Nevertheless, you are accepting allowing AIG to decide what we'll know, when we'll know it, and under what terms. Well, uh, forgive me, sir. As I mentioned, I think that Treasury can work with the Federal Reserve, work with the company. But why haven't they done it? I mean, it, uh, there's a lot of money out the door, a lot of time has passed, and if they're going to do it, why wouldn't they have done it before the money's out the door rather than after the fact? Well, Chair, uh, Congressman, it's a good question. I think that we are we're fighting a lot of fires at the same time, and this is a very important issue, and we'll, well, I, I hear the know, feedback. I, with all due respect, there's a unanimous agreement, I think, on both sides of the aisle that we want to know how the money's being spent. Uh, there's an acknowledgment on your part that that will give the taxpayer some basis to have confidence that we're doing something that really is a pretty bitter pill to swallow, uh, but we're doing it for a good reason. The gentleman's time has expired, but uh, Mr. Yeah, uh, Thank you. No, Mr. Cash Carey, if you want to respond briefly, and then we're going to go to Mr. Fortenberry. <coughs> well, again, Congressman, and, I thank you for the comment. You know, we got the message. Uh, we'll look into it, sir. Let, let me say to Mr. Uh, Welch, uh, we are going to, on the uh, second panel, we are going to get into some specifics about how the money has actually been spent. So uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, we'll go to Mr. Fortenberry for his five minutes, and then we, we will recess. Mr. Fortenberry. Thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary, for appearing today. I'm sure there are other ways and easier ways you can make a living. And so I do want to say from the outset I appreciate your professionalism and dedication to public service during these difficult times and in spite of the tensions around these policies. Thank you. Uh, there is an article in today's Omaha World Herald. It's basically the headline. It says, Banks Remain Strong, referring to our local banks despite profit decline. And the director of our banking system in Nebraska says, on average, they're very soundly operated. Now, these are fundamentally local banks, not the outside banks that are there. But an editorial comment before I start the questioning, it, I, I believe it is th these local institutions, mainly owned by local families, that have proximity to their portfolio obligations, which by their very nature then are more transparent as well as accountable. And I think that's a lesson that we need to think through as we look at uh, the entire systemic crises, difficulties, mm -hmm. however you want to term it. In, in that regard, as I said in my er earlier statement, and I appreciate the Chairman's intent to unpack this further, perhaps later, and maybe we'll see you again, are the, are our is our financial system, are our financial institutions too consolidated? You have nine banks now with approximately 50 percent of all deposited assets in this country. Uh, five banks, if I recall correctly, hold about 37 percent. Are we vulnerable because of that reason? I think we clearly are. Look where we are today. Look at the actions we've had to take to support systemic institutions. There's no question that we must undergo as a country very thoughtful regulatory reform to look at what our financial system should look like in the future to make sure that we're not here again. There's no question 
you know, there, there are benefits to scale, but when the cost, because these institutions get to be so big, are then going to be borne by the taxpayers, that's a real problem. I appreciate that insight. Now let me lose, move to a second, more specific question. Uh, it's my understanding that Goldman Sachs, the recipient of about $10 billion in TARP funds, actually repurchased their own stock to the tune of $2 billion last December. Now, earlier you had said this is a prohibited activity. Can you explain? Sure. Um, I don't have the details of the, uh, of the Goldman transaction. My understanding of it, because I think the chairman put out some data on this in the last few days, is that in the case of Goldman, my understanding is those were stocks that were repurchased over the course of the year but reported at the end of the year is my understanding. We've put in place restrictions. They cannot buy back their stock. The only way they can buy back their stock is if it's part of a normal ongoing uh, share plan for their employees. So if they want to incentivize, if some of these banks incentivize their employees with, let's say, restricted stock, and they want to maintain their share account, we enabled that one carve out. So if you want to incentivize your employees over the long term, then you can buy back the shares that are only those shares that are associated with the long-term uh, compensation agreements. That's the only place where firms under the capital purchase program are able to buy back their stock. Is that exception consistent with what happened with Goldman Sachs? Uh, in that case, I don't know, because my understanding of that, and I haven't looked at it in detail, but I can, my understanding is the bulk of those share repurchases were done before Treasury became an investor in Goldman Sachs. And so those would have, been, because it happened before we went in, it would not be subject to our agreements. The gentleman would yield. That's my understanding, too. Is that right? Okay. All right. Thank you. The third question is related to uh, Mr. Welsh's question as well. Please explain how extensively you actually review the books of these companies receiving TARP funds. We review applications as they apply to the TARP. So they have an application that they submit to their regulator. The regulator, in many cases, has been regulating these institutions for many years. For the large institutions, the regulators are physically on site. The regulators look at all of the data they have on these institutions and prepare a recommendation to Treasury. We then review that, tre that recommendation from the regulator and the data they provide us, and we review the application in making our decision on whether or not to invest. Uh, and I can walk you through that decision process if you're interested. For the vast majority of banks, ongoing review. On go for, for the vast majority of banks, you know, I mentioned we've invested in 489 banks so far. 30 more, 40 more each week, we do not go in and do ongoing uh, going through their books. Again, we've taken a policy perspective that the vast majority of these are healthy, well-run institutions. We just want them to make good commercial decisions and extend loans in their communities. It's, it's the one-off cases that we've had to go in and look at a lot of detailed analytics around their financial position, their balance sheet, et cetera, when determining are they systemic, do we need to step in? How much do we need to step in? Can, can you name those institutions and then how frequently you are doing this review? Well, in the one-off cases, it's been the auto companies, the auto finance companies, uh, AIG, Citigroup, Bank of America are the one-off cases that we've, had, we've done something extraordinary. In each case, we've gone in in a lot of detail. Remember, with the regulators, the regulators are on site. They're the ones sending us regular updates on what's happening at the banks, what's happening with their portfolios, So, so they're embedded. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, may I ask you unanimous consent to ask Mr. Keshkari just two questions not to be answered right now, but since you have the whole day, uh, if McKee gives you a card uh, on that, are you going to make Mr. Keshkari come back? Pardon? Are you going to make Mr. Keshkari come back? has agreed to come back. Okay, fine. The chair is declaring a recent Uh, in the next panel, we're going to hear from uh, some specifics on the use of TARP funds, and we're going to hear on the third panel from the Inspector uh, General for the Troubled Assets Relief Program. So stay tuned. Uh, recess for one half hour. Thank you. Thank you.